All right, here we go. Are you excited? I'm excited. Second to the last lecture. Almost done. Let's do it. We're talking about the Big Bang. So as we'll see, the Big Bang at this point is really just a title or a term that we give to the current most widely accepted model of how our universe began. Which, in a nutshell, seems like everything that makes up the universe was once really, really, really close together, really, really, really compact, and at the very beginning, basically burst into existence. Went from being really, really small to quite large, very quick, in sort of an explosive-like way. So, you can call it the Big Bang. It wasn't a regular explosion, to be sure, but yeah. So a lot of what I've told you about, what we've seen in this course, has been helped out quite a lot by the advance of technology and telescopes. So being able to see further and further out, we start to learn more and more things. Early on, we weren't really sure what else there was besides our own galaxy. We were able to see a bit further out, started to notice, actually, no, there are other galaxies. And then for a while, see a lot of galaxies, all seem to sort of look like spirals or ellipticals or these irregular ones too. I think maybe that's all there is. Until we have to see even further out, which as I've reminded you many times, means seeing things very far into the past, their past, and into the early stages of the universe, try to see, well, no, actually, it's only in the more recent, sort of modern period of the universe where we have all these spirals and elliptical galaxies, things like that. Most things that we think later became galaxies started out as these sort of more clumpy, small-ish groupings of stars. So it's just nice to point out that our advances in technology have played a big part in this process. And one of the most recent advances in our telescope technology has been the creation of uh, what's now known as the James Webb Space Telescope. So this is an illustration of uh, what it looks like and sort of where it is generally in space too. It can be hard to get a perspective, but the mirror, the reflector of this telescope is those golden hexagons, I think they're hexagons, pieced together to make one sort of large reflecting surface that collects a whole bunch of light so we can see very, very far away. And the whole reflecting surface is about 21 feet across, six and a half meters. So yeah, pretty large, like a two-story building the size of that golden uh, reflector. And so before this, it was sort of Hubble that was the most advanced space telescope at the time, at least to see in visible and sort of infrared areas of the spectrum. Now, James Webb is out and has gotten us some very cool images already and is able to see even further away, so even earlier into the history of the universe. I'm not sure if I've used this term before, but what we've been talking about for the last lecture, maybe two, and what we'll definitely be talking about now, is what is for sure considered uh, cosmology. We call it cosmology. So this is a fairly straightforward-ish definition of cosmology, the study of the observable universe's origins, its large-scale structures and dynamics, and the ultimate fate of the universe, including the laws of science that govern these areas. Pretty lofty goals. They're a big area of study. Right? So we've already been talking about the large-scale structures of the universe and how they came about. What they seem to do generally is like sort of the dynamics. So a theory about the origin of the universe and how it evolved to get to where it is today and where it might go afterwards, we would call it a cosmological model. It's just another one of Hubble's sort of deep field images where we see lots and lots of galaxies. Tiny little region in the sky. Very cool. I mentioned this idea before, but now we're thinking directly about our theory of how the universe began. Talk a bit more about it now. This idea that since galaxies that we see far away from us are all moving away from us, and we've interpreted this as the expansion of space-time, the growing of the space in between galaxy clusters and superclusters. If we continue the clock forward, things are going to keep moving away from each other. If we imagine then sort of turning back the clock, then things start to pull together, right? Everything's getting closer and closer together. And if you just follow that line of thought, but eventually everything just kind of squishes together into this infinitely small, infinitely dense, and infinitely hot speck. Yeah, how much else? Everything squished down in just one tiny speck. In essence, this is the premise of the Big Bang as a cosmological model. 
And everything at one point was all squished down together, and the very, very beginning of the universe, it just kind of popped, burst, expanded. Mm -hmm. Nice little animation, kind of thing of, you know, if things are moving apart, imagine sort of turning back the clock, things come close together, eventually squish together. I think I've mentioned this before, but and I'm not going to worry too much about some of the details. So just to say here that the rate that the universe is expanding, um, I've told you, is accelerating currently. And we think that earlier on, it was even decelerating a bit. That is to say that the expansion rate has not been constant. And so we can't just think about turning back the clock at a constant speed and then watch everything come back together. Because things are coming back together faster at times and slower at times. <laughs> It's a little bit tricky, but if we take into account what we think are the differences in this expansion rate over the whole history of the universe, and watch the universe as we turn back the clock, it seems to be that that point, that time when everything was crushed together into this infinitely small point, was just about 13.8 billion years. Hopefully that's not news to you, I've told you this a couple of times, but reiterating now. That process of sort of turning back the clock on the expansion to figure out how old the universe is, is one way of estimating the age of the universe. Um, but we do have other ways, and nicely enough, they all seem to give us about the same thing, which is 13.8 billion years. Um, one of the other ways is basically kind of like limiting how old the universe could be, or it has to be at least this old, is by dating the oldest things around. If you remember, we talked to you about clusters of stars in our galaxy and other galaxies, these, uh, particularly these globular clusters, where these groupings of stars that are really old. And we looked at this one before, Tukani, Tukani, I don't know, 47, right? This is a cluster in our galaxy, right? It's only 15,000 light years away from us, and we think it's about 13 billion years old, quite old. So if this is 13 billion years old, that's a pretty good indication that the universe, which it exists in, is at least that old, if not older. Another method for estimating the age of the universe has to do with what's known as the Cosmic Microwave Background, CMB. We'll talk more about this um, later on in this lecture, but just to say for now that this background is sort of like an echo from the early universe, and so by dating when this echo occurred, we can date the universe. Right? Here we have a few different diagrams of what the evolution of our universe could be like. So each one of these vertical sort of bars is a different universe. And at the bottom, go towards the uh, far past, uh, they've all started squished together right, to a point. All these universes start at a point. So we're assuming that this Big Bang model, but what happens after that to the whole universe depends, right? There's different options. So if we think that the universe started at this point and burst into existence, and then we know that we're currently in the universe we're in right now, we have like two sort of places in the history of the universe that we can sort of use as benchmarks. Very beginning, everything was together, and the present, where the universe looks like it does today. So how do we get from here to there? Well, we need to expand. And the sort of question becomes, what's going to happen as we continue going further? Currently, space-time is accelerating its expansion. But there's nothing to say for sure that that's going to keep happening, or that it might decelerate and start to eventually get to a constant rate, or keep decelerating and slow down and actually uh, stop expanding and contract. So these four models show like the different possibilities. On the far left, we have a universe that uh, not very long from now is basically going to start to decelerate its expansion. The expansion is going to slow down, slow down, and slow down. And it's actually going to keep decelerating, meaning that eventually it stops expanding entirely and then starts to contract. Everything comes closer together again. It starts to move closer together. And then very far in the future somewhere, everything's going to crush all the way back together and become a point again. Sort of the reverse of the Big Bang. One option. Uh, another option, the second diagram there, shows a universe that is uh, expanding currently, accelerating its expansion currently, but then soon will uh, decelerate. So it's going to 
uh, decelerate to the point where it's not going to expand at all. Right? It just continues along the same size forever and ever. Both of those are examples of universes that need to decelerate at some point after now in order to get to being all compacted together again or to being a just sort of static universe. It's not expanding or contracting. The third model there is basically one where the expansion has just been constant the whole time. It just continues to grow at a constant rate, bigger and bigger and bigger. And then finally on the right here, we have a model, which is the one we believe is correct currently, that the universe has been expanding and currently it's accelerating its expansion. So the rate that it's getting bigger is growing. And that's just going to keep happening in the future. It's going to keep getting bigger and the rate that it's getting bigger at is going to keep growing. So what determines which universe we're in? Basically it's what makes up that universe, what makes up our universe. And more specifically, like the density of that stuff. That stuff being regular matter, stuff we're made of, stuff most of the things that we interact with are made of. Dark matter, which I've told you a bit about, and dark energy, which I also told you about last time. Those are the things that we think make up our universe. So depending on how much of that stuff there is, and how dense that stuff is, it's going to lead to one of these options. I've already given it away, we think it's the accelerating. The current uh, leading model that best fits with all the observations that we have thus far is what's known as the Lambda CDM model. And it predicts an accelerating universe, this last option. So it's one that's going to accelerate and expand and never stop expanding. Well, that's the kind of universe we think we're in. This then is another picture of that kind of universe, one that's just going to accelerate in its expansion forever, but with a few more things drawn on it. So way down here, beginning of the universe, 13.8 billion years ago, give or take. And upwards, uh, time is evolving, time's growing. So we start out everything very close together, big bang, everything bursts into existence, and the universe expands, it starts growing, and as we'll see a little later, we think it grew really, really fast early on, and then uh, kind of continued to grow at a reasonable rate. However, like I said, the rate of expansion uh, changed over the history of the universe. Early on, right, in this sort of region, we think that that expansion slowed down a bit, and that was because everything was really close together, and so the gravitational attraction of all the matter, of dark matter, was much stronger. So that expansion slowed down a little bit for a while, and then more recently, things have moved far enough apart where the gravitational attraction between all the matter and the dark matter is less, and now dark energy has sort of taken over and has accelerated the expansion. And just note that in this picture, they're indicating a uh, supernova furthest away. Um, just one indication of like the things that we see very, very far away and very early on in the history of the universe. Supernovas, quasars, active galactic nuclei. So now we're going to go into a little bit more detail and sort of step through some of these phases as we understand them in the history of our universe. So this is what we might call the early universe. Not like incredibly early, but pretty early on. So around a hundredth of a second after the beginning. What was the universe like then? Well, it was still very hot. What is that, like a hundred billion Kelvin? Which is something like a hundred thousand times hotter than the core of our sun. The core of main sequence stars in general. And yeah, sort of describe it as like this soup of elementary particles. And those sorts of particles being like protons, and neutrons, and electrons, anti-electrons, also called positrons, um, and photons. Particularly very high energy photons, which are gamma rays. That's the gamma part of the spectrum. So this period of the universe, very energetic and still very dense. Only a hundredth of a second after everything had been squished down to this infinitely small point. So it's so energetic that these photons, these gamma rays, will go through this process all the time where two gamma rays can combine and there's enough energy there to create the mass and these new particles, electron and a positron, anti-electron. So from light, very energetic light, we can create an uh, electron and a positron. But it's still very, very dense, so this electron and this positron very quickly are going to find another positron and an electron 
or maybe just hit each other again, and annihilate. So we have an electron and an anti-electron, matter and its antimatter. If they meet, then they do this thing called annihilation. They basically convert to pure energy, and that energy comes out as photons, gamma rays, very high energy photons. So in this early period, there's other stuff around too, like the protons, the neutrons. Uh, most of the action was going on with gamma rays, like creating these electron and positron pairs, and those electron and positrons meeting other electrons and positrons, annihilating, creating gamma rays again. You know, this kind of continual process. Trying to picture what this might have looked like is rather difficult, partly because when we think what something looks like, we're thinking of seeing the light that's come from it, right? The photons that have either been emitted by it or have bounced off of it. But in this case, the only photons around are very high energy, they're gamma rays. This is way past the visible spectrum, so we wouldn't see anything anyway, or we wouldn't see those at least. And the other thing is these gamma rays, even when we could see them, they're constantly bouncing around. Right? So then they're taking part in these interactions. So they might just create other uh, matter, antimatter, or they might just bounce off of something, either free electrons or these protons maybe. But the thing is, like if I'm trying to look at like this table in front of me, then what I'm seeing are photons, light, that came from the lights above me, hit this table, reflected off of it, and then bounced to my eye. So I'm seeing the photons that came from this table. But at this stage, photons don't go hardly anywhere before they bounce, right? So a photon that would like leave this table doesn't ever make it to my eye, meaning I don't see this table. At this early on stage, these photons are just bouncing around everywhere, right? Wouldn't see anything. Maybe at best, you could say it'd just be like a really bright, fuzzy, glowing mess. And just to be clear, if you were actually there, you would be vaporized instantly. This is very, very hot, right? Bodies, humans, do not survive this. You're just, this is just a thought experiment. Uh, the one other thing to mention is, at this point, uh, neutrinos are around, and I've told you about neutrinos before, and I said they barely interact with anything ever. They'll get created into the center of the sun, and they'll go all the way through the sun without touching anything else. They'll go all the way through the Earth, almost never touching anything. However, the universe is so dense still at this point that neutrinos were actually interacting with things fairly regularly, right? bumping against things. So that was a hundredth of a second after the very beginning. But overall, remember, everything's expanding, right? The whole universe is expanding. And so what's generally happening is things are moving apart from each other, or the density at least is dropping. Things aren't quite as closely packed. And as things move apart too, the temperature can drop. So by about one second after the beginning, uh, the universe has expanded. It's a bit less dense to the point where uh, the neutrinos that were interacting earlier on have gotten to the point where they don't really touch anything anymore, right? Barely interact with anything. They do very rarely. So then keep going along. A couple of minutes after the beginning, about three minutes, the temperature has dropped to less than a billion Kelvin, about 900 million Kelvin maybe, which is now cool enough that protons and neutrons that are around can actually fuse together. And a proton plus a neutron is what we call deuterium. Before this, like protons and neutrons could do this, they could fuse together, but it was still so hot that they would be bombarded by other stuff and break apart again. So you could form it, but it wouldn't stick around. Finally, we cooled down enough where it forms and um, it's able to stick around. And beyond that, the deuterium that gets made can then combine with other protons to form Helium-3, two protons and a neutron. Uh, two deuterium nuclei might form together, or might fuse together to form helium-4, two protons and two neutrons. So we form various isotopes of helium, and in fact, other processes happen that also form some lithium. Lithium is three protons. I think the standard lithium is three protons and four neutrons, but I, I believe in this early time, there are a number of isotopes of lithium that are being formed. Pretty tiny amounts compared to the helium, but still some. So there's also maybe teensy amounts of beryllium formed for protons. Now keep in mind, when I'm talking about these atoms, these are 
not neutral atoms. I mean, these are just the nuclei of atoms. So it's still too hot for electrons to sort of settle in and become part of an atom and form like a proton with an electron around it is a standard hydrogen atom. All these things we're forming are just the nuclei. Electrons have not been able to kind of get attached and settle down into atoms. So after a few minutes, this process can start, but then, not very long later, it gets cut off. A few minutes after that, the universe has continued to cool down, and it's cooled down enough where now these protons and these neutrons aren't moving fast enough anymore in order to fuse together. So there's only this pretty short period of time where the universe actually formed elements, or the nuclei of elements, at least, that were heavier than just a proton. Form some helium, a little bit of lithium, maybe a tiny bit of beryllium. And I've told you, we think that all of the heavier elements in the universe after this, then, have been formed by stars. Whether that be fusing in the core of stars, or being created in the death of stars, the supernova. So, I mean, throughout this time, too, like I said, Electrons had not settled into atoms yet. I mean, they were just floating around freely, electrically charged things. These nuclei, also electrically charged things, floating around. And what that means for the light that's around there is it's still very readily going to bounce off of all these things. Meaning that at this stage, if we were to try to see what it looked like, it would still basically just be this fuzzy, glowing ball. Right? Because we never see any light that traveled directly from its origin. It's always just bouncing around everywhere. And so that state seems to have lasted a good while after that. A few hundred thousand years. Yeah. After a few minutes, we've created some heavier elements, small amounts of heavier elements, but then pretty quickly the universe cooled down enough where our elements weren't fusing together anymore. Protons and neutrons weren't fusing together, and so we don't uh, form anymore. So this state is actually sort of similar to the interior of a star, not like the star's core where it's hot enough to fuse, but in the sort of shells, the inner layers of the star, where it's still sort of this like soup of particles, electrons and protons and neutrons, and now some helium nuclei and lithium nuclei, but still no neutral atoms. Electrons still haven't become part of atoms yet. Just to say that these photons, like I said, just still bounce around all over the place. That is until we think something along the lines of like 400,000 years, Technically closer to like 380,000 years, but around 400,000 years. About 400,000 years after the beginning of the universe is when you think it finally cooled down enough that electrons could sort of settle into atoms. How cool did it need to be? It's a couple thousand degrees Kelvin. And so at that point, we now finally have the first neutral atoms. They're more like regular atoms. There are protons and neutrons and nuclei and electrons sort of circling around. And again, mostly hydrogen still, just a proton and one electron, but some helium, and then a little bit of lithium, teensy bit beryllium. I've tried to emphasize this point quite a bit of uh, photons bouncing around, not able to sort of travel in straight paths from their origin, and that's because it's a pretty important piece of this puzzle, and it leads to one of the strongest pieces of evidence for the Big Bang as the correct cosmological model. So right around that 400,000 year mark is when neutral atoms formed, and finally photons are not going to be running into stuff nearly as much anymore, right? Most of the photons can now finally travel in straight paths for a very long time. In fact, much of that light is still traveling through the universe today, and we see it today. It's no longer the same wavelength it was, because it was emitted when the universe was about 3,000 degrees Kelvin, which corresponds to a wavelength in the visible range. Uh, it's like yellowish light. So just before these atoms finally formed, neutral atoms formed, the universe would have looked like kind of like a glowing yellowish fuzzball. Once neutral atoms started to form, now this light can move sort of freely. Like I said, some of that light then is still moving through the universe. And since the beginning, so you know, the universe has expanded. And it's not, it's not just things moving away from each other, it's space time that's expanding. Which means that this light that was first emitted, or finally sort of left the beginning, from 400,000 years after the beginning, has been stretched. And so even though it's all around us now and it started out as sort of yellowish light, its wavelength is stretched. 
So it's no longer visible light. In fact, it is part of what we consider the radio portion of the spectrum now. And basically, that light now makes up this sort of background radiation throughout the universe. But before this time, you know, we can't really see anything in the universe. Like I said, it's, if anything, it would be just this like blindingly bright, glowing mess. But after this time, we now can finally sort of see things in the universe. The universe is cleared enough for light to start traveling uh, freely. One analogy for this period, or this process, is thinking about looking up at a cloud. When we look out in the universe, looking very, very far in the universe, we're seeing very, very early on in the universe. Eventually, we're seeing early enough where we're hitting the time before light could travel freely. This is similar to like looking up at the sky and seeing a cloud, and you just see the bottom of the cloud. Right? I'm looking up, all I see is the bottom of this cloud. And that is because any light trying to come through this cloud is just getting scattered and bouncing around. All I see of this cloud is the light that finally bounced off the very bottom stuff and starts coming to me. Before this time period, I don't see anything. So this sort of edge for this like event for this time period is sometimes referred to as the last scattering event. The last time photons were still bounced around all over the place before they finally just started to travel freely. This background radiation then from that last scattering is what we call the cosmic microwave background, CME. Right there, there's one picture of this cosmic microwave background. That picture is like of the whole sky, right? So you do like a survey of the entire sphere from the inside of it, and then cut that sphere and then stretch it out and sort of push it down on this 2D surface, right? So looking out in all directions, that is showing the temperature variation, or also like the wavelength variation, in this light that came from the very early universe, which is now just the background all over the place. The color is showing the difference in temperature, and it could seem like a lot, but it should be noted that the largest variation that it's showing is like one part in a hundred thousand. That's like 10 micro Kelvin, right? So, you know, the color makes it look like a lot. The overall variation is teeny tiny. And if you look at it, hard to say anything substantial about it. There's not really many big features there. But that itself actually tells us something. This background is all pretty uniform everywhere we look in the universe. Every direction we look, this background is fairly similar. Just telling us that at that point, like 400,000 years or so after the beginning of the universe, everything was very smooth or very even, evenly sort of distributed. So as I said a second ago, this is light from that early time period, started at about 3,000 Kelvin, sort of yellowish light. But now that the universe has expanded, this light has been stretched and its temperature then also has kind of cooled. So that today, its wavelength is about one millimeter, which is in the radio portion of the spectrum, but sometimes uh, the portions of the radio spectrum get designated different things. So these wavelengths in the radio portion are sometimes termed microwaves, which is why we call it cosmic microwave background. And its associated temperature now is about three Kelvin. Very cold. So pretty interesting to note that this exact sort of background was predicted based on the Big Bang as a cosmological model in 1940s. So some people were taking that Big Bang model seriously at that time and said, okay, well, if that's true, then we should see a background, something like this. Right? That was 1940s. Turned out those people didn't really get a lot of attention and their prediction was somewhat forgotten for a little while until the 1960s, a couple decades later, when this background was detected by accident. The guys who detected it eventually got a Nobel Prize. So here we have that picture of the CMB again, also with a little bit of a historical perspective, or like a wow, look how far we've come kind of thing, because you compare sort of the resolution that we were getting early on when we were looking for this cosmic microwave background. One of the early attempts to map it was with a satellite called COBE, C-O-B-E, and see the sample from that survey, right? Pretty low resolution. The variation in color or just shade there is variations in temperature. So you do see some variations, but eh, not a lot. Right? You have very high resolution. But the, the next big attempt was by this 
a spacecraft called the WMAP, and you see a sample of its measurements, much greater resolution than COBE, and then finally to sort of the most recent one, which is a sample from the picture I just showed you down here, is from a spacecraft called Planck, much higher resolution. Why do we care about the higher resolution? Well, it turns out that there's a lot of information in this picture. Right? I'll talk more about that in the next slide. But overall, like I said, the fact that this exists at all is very strong evidence for the Big Bang being the correct cosmological model. Basically indicates very strongly that the universe in fact was much, much smaller uh, and much denser and hotter at some time very long ago. And in fact, the Big Bang as a model only really became generally accepted as the correct one after the discovery of this cosmic background. So like I said, there's a lot of information we could get out of that background. How that happens, kind of complicated, but basically from the variation in temperature, even though it is small, there's variation there from how much that varies from like the distribution of the variation from the size of those variations, from the overall temperature that it actually is, we can use that information to calculate a lot of things about the universe. It's very important though that these calculations depend on having a particular cosmological model. In our case, we're assuming the Big Bang is the correct cosmological model. So the CMB itself is a good indication that the Big Bang is right, but if we take then the CMB along with that model, we can calculate the age of the universe. From the CMB, it seems to indicate the universe is 13.799 billion years old, plus or minus 0 0.038 billion years, or 38 million years. We can also use it to calculate Hubble's constant, at least the uh, Hubble's constant as it is today, and that's 20.6 plus or minus 0.29 kilometers per second per million light years. Remember, Hubble's constant was about how much quicker galaxies are moving away from us, the further away they are. It can also tell us about the percentages of the stuff that makes up the universe, right? Regular matter, dark matter, dark energy. And what we get is that matter, all kinds of matter, regular and dark matter, only make up about 31% of the stuff in the universe. And actually of all the matter, only about 5% of it is regular matter. It's stuff we made up of, stars are made up of, right? Protons, electrons, neutrons, that kind of stuff. The rest of the stuff in the universe seems to be dark energy. That being about 68.5%. As it turns out, these proportions, so these percentages of regular matter and dark matter and dark energy actually agree quite well with the percentages or the proportions we estimate from uh, data taken from looking at supernova very far away, like how fast they're accelerating. So it's kind of wild, um, but it seems pretty certain at this point that most of the universe is not made up of the regular stuff that we deal with. They're not even made up of the stuff that stars are made up of. Most of the universe, dark matter, dark energy. Kind of wild. I think I mentioned this before, but I'm rethinking about it again now. So here you go, it's a little pie chart of the composition of the universe, the stuff that makes up the universe. Two thirds of it, something like that, dark energy. Uh, about a quarter of it, dark matter, sliver, 5% regular matter, ordinary matter. Of that ordinary matter, most of it is hydrogen, and then some helium, and then a tiny bit of it is what all the stars in the universe are made out of and also what all the rest of the stuff is, planets and people and all that good stuff that we're so used to. Less than 1%. Okay, so I kind of took a little bit of a break from thinking about the evolution of the universe uh, to talk about the cosmic microwave background for a little bit. So getting back to now after that last scattering event when photons started to be able to travel freely through the universe and those photons now form this cosmic microwave background. What about after that? Well, remember that was about 400,000 years after the beginning? 
for the next few hundred million years, quite a long period now, it seems like there wasn't much going on. The universe is expanding, uh, there's a decent amount of hydrogen and some helium, a little bit of lithium, a little bit of beryllium, but there's no processes that are creating new light, really. So this whole period is probably fairly dark in the universe, which is why it's sometimes referred to as the universe's dark ages. Not dark as in dark matter, dark energy, dark as in light, not very bright. Throughout this time, though, a few hundred million years, matter is, we think, slowly clumping together, right? Forms slightly larger and larger things. So that's a few hundred million years, and then somewhere around 400 million years, maybe anywhere from like 300 to like 500 million years, pretty rough, but a few hundred million years later, or after the beginning of the universe, regular matter seems to have started to clump together enough to start to form stars. And stars group together in ways to form very early sort of primordial galaxies. So this goes on for quite a while. For the next like couple billion years, the rate of star formation just keeps going up. More and more stars are formed all the time. And that rate seems to have peaked somewhere around two or three billion years after the beginning. And then sort of slowly dies down, or sort of slowly declines after that. And I showed you this a while ago, I think in the lecture we talked about quasars, because uh, quasars also seem to be most active around this time too. So two to three billion years after the beginning, star formation, the rate of the amount of stars forming at any given time has peaked, tons of stars forming, and then uh, that rate sort of declines, keeps declining, until you get to what's sometimes called the modern era of the universe. And that's sort of like the second half of the universe. So by about six or seven billion years after the beginning, we start to come to a universe that looks a good bit like it does today. There's been a lot of star formation earlier, but that star formation has died down a good bit. Galaxies have started to form a lot earlier and clumped together for larger and larger galaxies. Right? They like collisions and mergers. And over billions of years, we start to form into larger galaxies and get to the kinds of galaxies we see a lot of today, the spiral galaxies, the elliptical galaxies. Those galaxies have grouped together into sort of clusters. Those clusters start to group together into superclusters. So somewhere by about six or seven billion years, the universe kind of looks like it does today. So that sort of got us to where we are today. Right? But if you recall, I started that story like about a hundredth of a second after the beginning. What happened before that? What happened maybe like really early on? One of the things about the CMB, about this cosmic background, and the fact that it is so even, right? there's very little variation throughout the entire sky. Look everywhere at the universe, it looks very similar. It's telling us that at the time that that radiation was emitted, everything was still very similar. There wasn't a lot of variation. But that was already 400,000 years after the beginning. So to explain why things were fairly similar still at that point, there wasn't a whole lot of variation throughout any area in the universe um, after a few hundred thousand years, we have come to this idea that we call inflation, which is basically the thought that very early on in the universe's lifetime, there was a period where it grew by a tremendous amount in a very short period of time. So everything is extremely close together, so it's all able to like sort of meld together, mesh together, like kind of get to the same place, come to we call it like equilibrium, everything's sort of similar, and then all of a sudden bursts and grows by an incredible amount. The exact amount is difficult to pin down, but we could say maybe something like 50 orders of magnitude. 50 orders of magnitude means it grows by like a factor of one followed by 50 zeros, multiplying by that. It's an incredible burst in uh, size. However, you should note that before this period of inflation, the universe was unbelievably small. So even after this inflation, the universe is still not terribly large. Think of it something like order of like 10 centimeters at that point after inflation. Just you know, size of like a grapefruit. Anyway, I think this process occurred roughly between 10 to the minus 37 and 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the very beginning. Meaning this happened very, very early on, 
very, very soon after the very beginning and over a very short period of time. Could have a little bit of a animation to illustrate why maybe it's called inflation or a way to think about it. And that basically has to do with uh, blowing up a balloon, inflating a balloon. And if you've ever done that, you might know that when you blow into it, at first it's pretty difficult. So you gotta go blow pretty hard. And for that first breath, the size of the balloon grows really quickly. Right? And then you kind of keep blowing and then it's growing at sort of steady rate, right? fairly steady rate. But that first sort of period, that really big breath right initially, is like bursts, right? That's sort of like the inflation period. All right, there she goes. Oh, that first burst. And then sort of a steady sort of expansion, grow, grow, grow. Yeah. So what happened even before that, right? Quite make the zero, it really quite make the zero. Let's say more about that in a second. But yeah, what was going on around that time? Well, like I said, the inflation happened you know, between like 10 to the minus 37, 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the beginning. So the idea of what might have caused that to happen has to do with the changes in the fundamental forces in the universe. The fundamental forces as we understand them. So in order to explain that, I'm going to take a slight sidebar, talk about forces. And we've kind of already talked about them. You know, uh, gravity, the force of gravity is one. And we talked about stars, the interior of stars. I told you a bit about, or I at least mentioned, the strong force. That's another one. The force that holds electrons and protons together is part of the electromagnetic force. That's another one. And I might have mentioned the weak force. Generally, neutrinos are very much involved with the weak force. But those are pretty much it. Right? They make up essentially the way that we understand how things interact with each other, at least matter, regular matter, are through these four forces. The thing is, we think that these four forces are actually originally sort of part of one unified force, what we call a unified force. And you can think about this a little bit like if you know anything about electric electromagnetism, Right? It has to do with electricity, it has to do with magnetism, light. Not all that long ago, a couple hundred years ago, we understood that there was an electric force, we understood that there was a magnetic force, but we didn't actually know they were part of the same thing. Eventually though, we realized that those are two aspects of the same force. So we kind of combine those together. We've already seen actually that at very high energies, the electromagnetic force and the weak force actually act in the exact same way they become sort of the same force. You say they unify. And we know that because we're actually able to reach those kinds of energies already in particle accelerators. So we can see that the weak force and the electromagnetic force combine. They actually call it the electroweak force. We think at even higher energies, or another way is to say that even higher temperatures, the strong force actually combines and becomes part of the same thing as the electroweak force. And then you go to even higher energies, even higher temperatures, eventually we think gravity actually combines with those two. So all those forces at very, very high energies, incredible temperatures, actually act in the exact same way and are basically the same force. So what does that have to do with this whole picture of the very early universe? Well, we see in this diagram along the bottom is showing time after the Big Bang, or after the very beginning of the universe. Along the top is showing the temperature of the universe at those times. So remember, thinking about the universe, you're turning back the clock, everything's getting squished more and more together, getting denser and denser and hotter and hotter. So you go back in time, it's hotter and hotter and hotter, more and more energetic. And at these earlier times, we think that the four forces that we know of combine to become one, right? all the way back to 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the beginning of the universe. Incredibly short period of time, right after the beginning. We think right around that time is when gravity separated from the other forces. Sometimes it's called freezing out or froze out from the other forces. It becomes sort of unique. We move a little bit further on, somewhere around 10 to the minus 35 seconds after the beginning of the universe, the temperature drops down a bit more, and we think that's when the strong force separated from these other forces. 
If you recall, that's right around the time where we're telling you that this inflation process happened between 10 to the minus 37, 10 to the minus 32 seconds. So 10 to the minus 35, right in there. That's to say that we think the separation of the strong force is actually, in a way, what caused the inflation. The universe just suddenly burst in size, grow tremendously. So you keep moving further and further along, the temperature drops down more and more and more, eventually the weak force then separates from the electromagnetic force, and we have, now today, the four forces as we know them. So that's getting pretty early on, you know? You might say, what happened even before that? Right? That's not quite a zero, right? Or the, the beginning. It turns out, we don't really know. Right? And in fact, beyond that, it's just very hard to say, at least from any sort of uh, broadly accepted physical theory. So the theories that we have about forces and theories like general relativity and quantum theory, right? the thing is, they all just kind of fall apart at that point. You get to these extremely short periods of time, extremely intense situations. Right? The universe has been crushed down. It's just this tiny little spot. Our normal theories as we have them just kind of fall apart. They don't work anymore. So this is what I was saying earlier, you never quite get to zero. Right? Even though we get extremely close with our modeling, this uh, Big Bang cosmology, once you get less than that 10 to the minus 43 seconds, which is sometimes called the Planck time, we can't say. Right? At least this particular model can't say. There are, of course, people who have tried to make theories and understand what actually did happen before that, but that definitely gets beyond this course. And for the most part, I would say they're not generally you know, accepted as being correct in the same way that like the Big Bang seems to be pretty well accepted as, yeah, this is correct, as far as it goes anyway. So a question that people often ask at this point is, well, okay, that was the beginning of the universe. What happened before that? And I should say that the answer depends very highly on what you mean by before. In the normal sense, if you're saying before something happened, you're talking like in a temporal sense, right? Like as in like the now and after now, before now, or like the present, past, the future. The normal ways of talking about time, right? So when you say before, you're usually saying earlier in time. But there was no time before that. Time as we know it began with the Big Bang, began with the beginning of our universe. The beginning was not just the beginning of like the forces and the creation of matter and energy, but it was also the creation of space-time itself. So that includes time. There was no time before the beginning. I tried to come up with a way of saying this, an analogy of sorts. I don't know, this is the best I got, which is to say that asking what happened before the Big Bang is sort of like if you were to watch someone draw a circle and then ask them, where was that circle beforehand? Even where was it? It didn't exist. It wasn't anywhere. Similar way, there was no before, at least in any usual sense. What is there besides our universe, other than our universe? Now, that's kind of a different question. And for sure, we don't know. That's for sure. But, you know, there are certainly theories and models that predict things um, outside of our universe or other than our universe. Not outside again in a normal sense because outside inside is thinking in terms of like space spatial arrangement right and all the normal ways we understand space are within our universe because that is space and time so maybe other than our universe in some way um this gets for sure beyond this course we don't need to worry about it but we just say that one of the leading theories with like what else is there other than our universe has to do with something called string theory which basically postulates that there are things in more dimensions than just the ones we exist in. So we exist in space-time, a four-dimensional thing. That would be like up and down, left and right, forward and back, and then like past, present, and future. Right? Three dimensions of space, one dimension of time. Four dimensions. So these other theories postulate that what we see in these four dimensions is actually sort of like a projection of things 
that exists in more dimensions. And then I think the leading sort of thought in string theory right now is like things that are 11 dimensional. Just no way to even like visualize that. It was just bonkers. But basically, these things are existing in 11 dimensions, and we sort of see projections of them or experience projections of them. And we have to, I mean, in that sense, yeah, that's true. We are projections of these kinds of entities too. Atoms are, electrons are, protons are, so we're made of them too. Everything is. Again, these are ideas, these are thoughts. I'd say that those kinds of theories are definitely not what you would say proven. So you would say, I, I could tell you that we know about these things for sure. Don't really know about them. But it's sort of extensions of this whole cosmology, along with trying to sort of push our understanding of the forces and uh, theories of physics as we know. Some of this stuff just hurts the brain. And so that's about it. I'm going to end here with this picture, which is of the kinds of pictures you might have seen of the universe. And this is a picture of the universe and its entire history. Um, pretty wild. But it's actually very similar to the one I showed you earlier. It's just turned to the side. So there was this point, very beginning, everything was together, and then started to expand, and then very, very soon after that, you have inflation bursts and grows incredibly in size, and then a few hundred thousand years after that is when it's cooled off enough so that electrons combine with uh, nuclei, and we finally have these photons and light that travel freely instead of bouncing around everywhere. And that light now forms this cosmic background. A few hundred million years after that, stars start to form and then continue along. Galaxies form, galaxies start to uh, collide, merge together, grow larger and larger. Those galaxies start to group together into clusters. So those clusters start to group together into super clusters till we start to get in the second half of the, this picture. After like several billion years, we start to get a pretty similar picture to what we have today. The whole thing seems to have kicked off 13.8 billion years ago. Here take. So that's it for this lecture. I hope it was intelligible, you learned something. And next time is the last lecture, and I believe we're going to be talking about the possibility and the attempts to find life outside of Earth extraterrestrial life. Exciting stuff. Yeah. So, until then, have a good one.